Well, let me invite you to Revelation 19 if you're not there already. Once again, uh, the sequence is going to move forward as we enter into a non-chronological but still somewhat chronological section of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation kind of overlaying on top of each other uh, moment after moment after moment and uh, leaving us uh, a little bit confused. Is it any wonder that the church has for centuries, it seems, been thoroughly unsure <laughs> in their assurance of what the Revelation stands for or shows? And so... Um, we are left with individual clues, and just reminding us again that every time we come to the book of Revelation, it is it is well met for us to dive into the Old Testament as uh, probably the very best source of commentary and understanding of what's going on in these passages, and yet uh, we come, come across a passage this morning in Revelation 19 that is, uh, that is sequential uh, to a certain level. Verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1 just begins with that phrase, after these things, right? So it moves forward into something we've already seen four other times, actually, in the book of Revelation. And four times we've witnessed, uh, with a, with a slightly different angle, the return of Christ. Uh, we, we see it at the end of, uh, the trumpet judgments and so forth. And so about the fourth time, or the fifth time now, we are looking at what the return of Christ looks like. And each time we're not seeing precisely the same image. It is almost as if uh, we are looking at different facets of the same gemstone. And I want you to just imagine, uh, ladies, for those of you that actually have a diamond on your ring, you can stare down at it uh, and, and you can look at that diamond. Mine, mine has no such rock. But you can see that if you hold it aloft to the light, it, it reflects at different angles. And if you turn it this way, you get a, a slightly different hue. And if you turn it that way, it's a slightly different hue. And this is what the book of Revelation is showing us about the return of Christ. And each moment we get a chance to look into a facet but not to fully comprehend all of it. Because again, I think we are left with the same problem that the writer of Revelation, John, has had all along. Every time he sees something, he's stuck using like. Because how do you describe the indescribable except for saying this is the best way I can describe it? It's like this, it's like that, it's like this, it's like that. And so we're stuck once again with this uh, glittering, refracted light bouncing off of every face, each angle perfectly rendered and yet not fully comprehending the whole thing. So I want you to, I want you to look at the return of Christ through that eyes that every time we, we see something in scripture describing it, we're not seeing the whole because it is going to be more majestic, more glorious, more awe-inspiring, if you will, more wonderful than you can comprehend, than we could possibly comprehend this morning. Well, after these things, that is after the judgment of Babylon that he's described in the last couple of chapters, chapters 17 and 18, uh, it, they're encased within themselves within the, the seventh bowl of God's wrath poured out in Revelation chapter 16, uh, verses 17 through 21. We saw that. And so chapters 17 and 18, once again, kind of arise out of that final bowl judgment that's described there. And what follows is often in your Bibles in chapter 19 titled the fourfold hallelujah or something like that. It depends on, depends on what the translators of your Bible thought this section should be titled, but it's often titled something along that line. And it is a response of unbridled worship at the return of Christ. Doesn't that seem fitting? Uh, I, I don't know if you have, I don't know if you have imagined what the return of Jesus is going to be like. I certainly have. I have sought many times to imagine what the return of Christ has been like. And at various points in my Christian journey, it has been sometimes a terrifying comprehension. You know, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be positively terrifying. I would think to myself as I, as I wonder about my own redemption and then I would, I would calculate that out. But then having grown more secure in my knowledge of Christ and certain of that redemption, that has given way, that fear has given way to a hope and it has also given way to a bit of uncertainty as to exactly what is contained. And that's because once again, we're always looking at different facets of the diamond. Chapter 19 forms, in some sense, the conclusion of the book of Revelation, the conclusion of the tribulation period, because what we're about to enter into, we're, we're finally done at the end of chapter 19 with the wrath of God, which is kind of the little sub-series that we've been in uh, for the last several weeks. But uh, we begin to move on towards more of what we'll see as the fulfillment of that blessed hope, as Titus refers to it. Lest we forget, let me remind you that we're waiting for the return of Christ. 
We're still the disciples standing on top of the hill, the Mount of Olives, looking in the sky, waiting for his return, with the angels kind of tapping us on the shoulder saying, what are you staring at? We're waiting for his return, but in the interim, we have work to do. In the interim, we have work to do. Uh, it, it pays us no good to be in the, uh, in the old insult so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, does it? We have a life to live here that is bent on replicating the image of Christ in our life and in sharing that love of Christ with those around us so that Christ can be replicated in their lives. So it's for this reason that the reaction of the godly to the return of Jesus will be one of worship. We are waiting for the return of Christ, his return, his reign, his glory, his revelation, his presence. That is our hope. And Titus terms that our blessed hope. So let me ask you if I could to have you stand as we attempt to read in the book of Revelation the first ten verses. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you, his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. You may be seated. As we look at this first hallelujah, if you will, John hears something like a loud voice. And again, it's this something like a loud voice. He didn't know how to describe it. It's a, it's a multitude of voices. And, and I'm just reminded that the very last time we saw a multitude of voices or a multitude that was so massive was in Revelation 7, 9. In Revelation 7, 9, we see this multitude standing around the throne. It is so huge. John says nobody could count it. No mortal man can count it. It's beyond our comprehension. Uh, it was a multitude from every nation and from every tribe and from all of the people groups and from every language that's ever been spoken on earth. And they're standing before the, before the throne of God and they're standing before the Lamb of God clothed in white robes. They're holding these branches and they're crying out with the Lamb of God, uh, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And after that, of course, we saw the angels and the elders, and some are shouting hallelujah, and some are bowing, and the elders are throwing their crowns at the feet of the throne, and uh, the worship is unbridled. And I think this might be the same group that's responding here. I think we're seeing a continuation of that portion of the book of Revelation. Either way, whether it's the same group or not, that multitude is the first to cry out hallelujah, and hallelujah means what? Let's do a little pop quiz here. Hallelujah means... Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise God. It's, it's comprised of those uh, two Hebrew words, praise Yahweh, if you will, uh, the name of God Yahweh in the Old Testament, sometimes uh, brought into English very, very poorly as Jehovah, but, uh, but leave it as it is. It's praise Yahweh or praise God, praise the Lord. It's a celebration, not just uh, a celebration of sound. And, and too often, uh, we might, especially as English speakers, 
mindlessly, accidentally repeat the word hallelujah without thinking about it. You know, we sang the song and, and we sing hallelujah, the Lord our God. The, you know, how many of you, by the way, were, were, were struggling against singing that, that phrase when we read it in the text? I was struggling with singing that phrase when we read it in the text. Uh, I was, but, uh, we can cry out hallelujah without recognizing that it means praise God. We can cry out on Easter, uh, Hosanna, which means save us now. Uh, and without thinking about what Hosanna means on, uh, well, not Easter, but Palm Sunday or, or both. Uh, but, you know, you think about the, the words that we use and another church word we often use is amen. And we often forget that amen means something like that's the truth or I agree with that or I affirm that or something along those lines, you know. And so we say amen as if it means over and out, right? On the CB. It doesn't mean over and out, right? It, 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 it's, but that's oftentimes how we treat our prayers. Um, I'm suddenly reminded Suddenly reminded of the uh, the mother and the the daughter who were praying together one night about uh, about their dad and and uh, as as their time together in prayer came to a conclusion, uh, mom patted her daughter on the back and says, "You go go on to bed now." And and the little girl says, "No no no, mommy, we we can't. You didn't say amen." And she goes, "Because because I'm not done yet." It has nothing to do with the sermon. I was reminded of thought about it. So. There you go. I guess if you're not done yet, don't say amen. I don't, I, I don't know. That's what that means. But we use words all the time. And we use words of exclamation all the time. And we don't have any trouble understanding what they mean. I mean, if you're, if your team wins, if you're one of those people, I'm not a sports people, but if your team wins, you have no problem jumping up and down and yelling yes or hooray or victory. Or, and you know exactly what it means. So I would just encourage you to be mindful of words like hallelujah or amen or hosanna when we come to them in scripture to think about what they mean. That was a long digression, perhaps, but it's important to me that we know what we're saying when we say it. God is to be praised because salvation, glory, and power belong to Him. We read through uh, this segment, uh, God is being praised because salvation, glory, and power belong to Him. He's to be praised because His judgments are true and righteous. True and righteous. Remember this phrase, we used it in Sunday school this morning, we sometimes have to speak the truth in love. Those two kind of go together. Well, with God, His judgments are true and righteous. He never errs in judgment. He never compromises truth, and He never compromises righteousness. Those things that we look to uh, are because that is the nature and the character of who God is. Think about a human judge, and we've heard quite a bit about human judges in the last couple of weeks, haven't we? Uh, but think about human judge. A human judge does not have all of the facts, no matter how diligently they may seek to uncover all of the facts. Uh, they are looking at a law that is quite external to themselves. As a matter of fact, if you were watching any of the uh, confirmation hearings for uh, Amy Coney Barrett, one of the one of the struggles that she was having to communicate over and over and over again was that, uh, you know, it's my opinions are not entirely relevant. Uh, in fact, my opinions aren't relevant. The law is the relevance, and it is my task, she would say, or she did say, as a, a judge or a justice to be able to take the law that's comprised uh, in the documents of our nation and to be able to say, well, this is what it says, irrespective of what I may feel. I watched a, uh, a speech from her uh, she gave at Hillsdale uh, University, and, and she says, you know, uh, my emotional context uh, in the case is completely irrelevant. What I think, what I believe to be true is not relevant. The only thing that is relevant is the law that's placed before me and my task at upholding that law. You think every judge is the same way, and some measure to be the same way. They're dealing with something that is external to themselves, but not God. The law it's not external to God. The law is a direct outgrowth of who exactly He is. The law of God is God's law, and it's not an extension of good ideas that He used to fashion the universe. As a matter of fact, Psalm 119, 27, Psalm 119, verse 27 says, Make me understand the way of your precepts. In other words, in other words, number one, let me just start there. God, help me to understand your law. Number one, I want to know your law. So that, the psalmist continues, so that I will meditate on your wonders. I think I've got that up there, actually, yeah. So in other words, help me to know your law, because God, it is your law that is a direct revelation of the wonder of who you are. In other words, everything about God is 
not everything, but God has revealed who He is in His law. You know, uh, we are commanded in the law to love our neighbor as ourselves. Why? Because that is the nature, character, and being and purpose of who God is. God is love. We are not to murder in the law. Why? Because God is the giver of life. He is the one who has given that. And it's not up to us to uh, go directly against what God has given. And we could go on through all of those, but that's not our case this morning. The law reveals what God is like. And so when God judges, he will always judge completely consistent with his character. We never have to worry about God someday changing his mind in a legal sense. He's not going to do it. He's not going to suddenly decide one day, you know what, I've had enough of you people. Because he has already completely consistent with himself visited the judgment of all of his wrath against my sin upon Jesus Christ, against your sin upon Jesus Christ. And for everyone who embraces him, the sin against Jesus Christ. And God's not going to at some point in time change the rules or change the law. There are no amendments to him. He will always judge consistent with righteousness and truth because that is who he is. And so the cry goes out, hallelujah, that all of God's judgments are consistent with his character, his nature, and his being. He upholds his standard because it is the same as upholding himself. God will always be consistent. It's a great doctrine. It's a great teaching. And so you see these first two verses, they, they uphold God's work in judgment on the great harlot of Babylon. We saw in the last couple of chapters how this is the, the Babylon or this great harlot is the full expression of rebellion against God and it has been met appropriately by the glory and power of God in judgment. Wonder of wonders, he has, in the midst of judgment, also provided salvation to some. There is glory in the judgment of God, especially when we step back to recognize that his judgment is deserved by every person, and yet salvation is given to some. When we read about God's judgment in the book of Revelation, and that is an overriding theme of the book of Revelation. What are some of the primary themes in Revelation? Well, I can tell you one of them right now. God will judge. <sighs> Secondary theme that goes right along with it, God will save. He saves in the name of Christ. So it's perfectly meet and appropriate that we celebrate the communion this morning. Praise God that He saves even as He judges. Praise God that He avenges to defend those whom he has chosen as his own. He talks about that. And the final phrase I want you to notice, please, gives you and I who know Christ the freedom and the power to trust ultimately in God's judgment. God reminds us in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's very easy, isn't it, to come to <laughs> theoretically. But if you're in a situation where you have personally been injured by someone, it is much harder to apply that reality. But this is what God exhorts us to, to absolute dependence upon Him as the righteous King and ruler and judge. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That comes right out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verses 35 to 36. Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time, their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will, listen to this, the Lord will vindicate his people and will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone. And there is none remaining, bond or free, and he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. In other words, God's judgment, as it's revealed here in the book of Revelation, is consistent with God's promises back in Deuteronomy, and that is God is going to judge his enemies who have chosen to pursue every other god except for him, and he is going to at the same time vindicate the people who have chosen to be obedient to him. And that's what this first hallelujah circles around, if you will, this satisfaction of God's judgment and the avenging of the blood of his bondservants on unbelieving people. Praise God who saves by his glory, his power through judgment and truth and righteousness. And so the first hallelujah asks us, Christian, will we praise him? Will you praise him when he judges? Second hallelujah we can do very, very quickly. 
and that uh, praise God comes from God's eternal judgment portrayed upon Babylon. And very simply, we don't have a lot of time to dwell on it. Her smoke rises forever and ever. We'll deal with that later on. But it mirrors Isaiah chapter 34.10, which in that passage, you could just write it down and maybe go back to it later, but Isaiah 34.10, it mirrors this description of the judgment that God brought upon the nation of Edom. Edom being one of the people who should have known better, uh, but chose to join along with uh, Babylon, historical Babylon, in their judgment of God's people. And uh, as a result, God says their judgment burns forever. We'll skip that second hallelujah because of its brevity, and we'll spend a little bit more time on the third hallelujah that's presented in the text. And uh, simply say this, that worship is a response to the revelation of God. True worship is a response to the revelation of God. It's not just a song. Uh, worship is not merely a shout. It's, it's not merely something that we do. It's not any of those things. It involves a song, perhaps. It involves a shout, perhaps. It involves us doing something, perhaps. It involves a heart attitude, perhaps. But it is not exclusively any one of those things. Proper worship, that is actually worship, is always a reaction. It's always a response to some revelation, to something about God. Worship happens when we see or we hear or we otherwise experience God. And out of that, we respond with worship, and we do it all of the time when something captivates our attention. For me, it might be a sunset. I've got a little alarm set on my clock, and every night, about seven minutes before sunset, it's automatically, I don't know how the people that designed it did it, but every seven minutes before sunset, I get a little warning. So if I want to, I can go outside and I can stare at the setting sun. And I don't do it all of the time, but I frequently want to. Why? Because it captivates me. I cannot see a sunset or a sunrise for that matter without seeing the colors and seeing the beauty and seeing the glory of it all and responding with some degree of, wow. Folks, that's the essence of worship. We observe something true about God and we respond. It's one of the reasons why I love so many of the hymns that we sing because those that have gone before us have had those moments and written them down so that we can co-experience that worship with them. The same is true of many of the, uh, the newer songs that might move me to worship as well. Somebody has, has written out something that will help me to co-experience worship with them, celebrating some aspect of who God is. Well, that's what's happening at the third hallelujah. The first hallelujah, you've got this great multitude in heaven. They're in awe of salvation in the light of righteousness and true judgment at the hands of the glorious and powerful God. The second hallelujah, God is being praised because that judgment of God has been displayed in the eternally rising smoke of the judgment on Babylon or the full representation of rebellion and evil in the world. And the third hallelujah rises out of that judgment again because God is judge. We saw them all the way back in Revelation in the throne room. Remember, as John is taken up to heaven, he sees the throne and he sees one sitting on the throne and he sees the appearance of the one on the throne and then he goes into that again, that he was like this, he was like that, he was like, 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 like. Because what can you do to describe God who is too great to be expressed in words but by simply saying, this is the only way I know how to express him. He was glorious and shiny and big and large and overwhelming. That's about the best that John could do. Around the throne on which God sits, there's these 24 thrones with a white-clad, becrowned elders upon them. And, and around the throne are these four living creatures covered with eyes. That's a very weird description, once again. It, one looks like a lion, another one looks like a calf, a third looks like a man, another one looks like an, evil, uh, an eagle. rather. And in that scene, the four living creatures cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And what happens? The elders respond. They take off their crowns once again. They throw it to the ground and they worship because God is worthy. That's the essence of this third hallelujah, because God is worthy. And here at the end of this seven-year tribulation upon the earth with the harlot of Babylon judged and already cast into the flames, the response of worship continues as these 24 elders and the four living creatures once again fall down and worship saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Heaven itself will praise God because heaven itself is yearning for the same redemption or for the same exhibition of God's glory that we are waiting for. Truth has happened, righteousness has happened, good has happened, God is praised. Praise God. 
We go through the first three hallelujahs, the first three of the praise God statements, and, and I simply want to lay out there for you to contemplate upon how much of my life today, how much of my life today genuinely and honestly consists of worship to God. We'll move on into the fourth hallelujah. It comes roaring in response to God. A voice comes from the throne, John says. He has this voice coming from the throne. And, and, and again, remembering that we're looking at the book of Revelation, which is filled with all kinds of weird and strange imagery. So maybe the throne itself is shouting, or maybe he's describing God sitting upon the throne. But either way, it's the same thing. Who sits on the throne? Well, God does. So if a voice comes from the throne, ultimately it is from God. So he has this voice from the throne, which is God's. It's the throne. Uh, um, and God calls out for praise. God calls out for praise. I don't think he was going to wait until the end of time. I think God calls out for praise from you and I today. Worship is a necessity for a Christian. The um, Bible says that he inhabits the praise of his people. That doesn't mean that God waits for his people to start worshiping and then he moves in. Sometimes I, I have that, I hear that idea kind of preached or, or proclaimed, you know, if we start worshiping, God will move into the arena. That's, that's not exactly true, but God is present, fully present in the praise and worship of his people. Why? Because worship is ultimately a representation of our response to the revelation of who God is. Paul the Apostle uh, calls out, and he calls you slaves. I'm looking at this term bond servants that's present in this fourth hallelujah. Bond servant does not mean somebody who's been hired. It means somebody who's been purchased. Paul the Apostle calls you slaves. He says, but now, Romans 6.22, but now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. In other words, when we are set free from sin, we are purchased as slaves to God. Do you think of yourself as a slave to God. Or, what about this one? In Peter's letter, he says, I want you to act as free men. I like that. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. Okay, that's good. But use it as bond slaves of God. So we're set free. We're free slaves. <laughs> but we're not free of slavery. <laughs> we are slaves to God. And of course, Paul would warn us later on in the book of Romans, I think chapter 8, he says, you know, you're slaves to whomever you obey. <laughs> if you're obeying sin, you're a slave to sin. If you're a slave to God, you're obeying God. You don't, you don't rule your own life. You are ruled by God who, through His abundant grace, has purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ for Himself. And that should make us think, and it should make us ponder exactly how does a slave respond in this world, knowing that he never deals exclusively with himself, he always deals with his master. We could read in 1 Timothy 6, all who are under the yoke as slaves, talking about human slaves of human masters, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. If it is true that a human slave owes honor and glory to his human master, how much more for a slave of Christ, a Christian, to owe honor and glory to our slave master? Christian, we must not think of ourselves as independent. We must not think of ourselves as autonomous, that we run our own life. That is the sin of Eden, going back to Genesis chapter 3. Has God really said? Did he really mean it? He does, God lied to you. He didn't want it. And Eve and her desire and Adam along with her chose to disobey God and to choose their own autonomy rather than to be servants of God. Don't think of yourselves as free. We are not Christians free to do as we please. We are bond slaves to God, purchased by the blood of Christ, called into fellowship with Him. And so what does our Master command? Well, He commands praise. He commands praise. He commands worship and adoration. Praise from everybody who will fear Him. Whether in the grand scheme of things or in the eyes of others, we are great and powerful or small and powerless. Don't be held back from spending effort on worship. How might you spend more effort on worship than you do? 
Now, I don't, that is a nice way of saying, you know, if you worship him on a, on, on a level three, how can you get to level four? If you worship him at a level 12, how can you get to level 13? How can we get more worship in our life today to God? And I would say, if worship is a reaction to who God is, learning more about God, drawing closer to God. Because worship in and of itself is not the end goal, it's the result of knowing him more. Why praise him? Well, because he's worthy of praise. Seek him. Seek him if you don't see him. Seek if you do not feel that he's worthy of praise. Seek him diligently without delay until you know him well enough to automatically overflow with his praise. Praise him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, these voices cry out, praise God for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. I want to break into song here. This unified voice of many voices cries out with that fourth and final hallelujah. We are tempted to sometimes see the end of the phrase in verse 6 as separate from what follows in verse 7. Some of our Bibles are laid out that way because there's a paragraph ending there that goes into the next. Well, it's not separated. It's all together. Verse 7 continues that praise and turns our attention to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The reaction, if you will, after the return of Jesus. This fourth hallelujah continues with the saved of every generation shouting together, let's rejoice, let's be glad, let's give the glory to Him. Why? Why all of this self-talk? Why all of this saying, I, we, we need to worship? Because the marriage of the Lamb has come. It's an image we see often enough in Scripture. Marriage is designed to be a reflection. It's designed to be a picture of what God looks like, or rather, what the relationship between Jesus and His church looks like. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5. Don't have time to dwell into that this morning. I'd like to do that, but it makes it clear that marriage is meant to be sort of a, a moving picture display, is that this is the relationship between Jesus and His church. I've been to a lot of weddings over the years. I've done a lot of weddings over the years. I know other pastors who have done more, and that's not what I'm in for, but I tell you, I, I've noticed a few things. There's at that moment in the wedding, even in our wedding still today, where everybody stands and looks at the back of the room as the bride begins to make her entrance, and all of the attention turns upon the bride. Years ago, I had a friend of mine in ministry tell me, don't look at the bride, look at the groom. And so, I have, over the years, made a habit of turning to my left, and at least out of the corner of my eye, looking at the groom while everybody else is focusing on the bride and usually watching him melt. Listen, there's an image there of Christ in the church. As much as we cannot help putting attention upon the church, it's really about Christ. It's really about Christ. That's the picture that marriage is meant to give us so much more there, though, that we don't have time to get into. The bride of Christ, the church, has been given by God the privilege and the joy of wreathing herself in the good works of obedience that's mentioned in uh, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Uh, he says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And it's not unusual, by the way, to see both the bride and the bridegroom playing the role of the church uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But usually Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is displayed as the bride just trying to communicate what God has in his relationship with his church. Real quickly, the passage ends with a bit of misplaced worship, and, and I hope we don't misplace our worship, but the angel who's been speaking with John commands him, I want you to write these things down. He's only done that several times in the book. Um, he says, I want, you to, I want you to write this down. Um, write that everybody who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb and the celebration of the coming of Christ for his church and of the church being united finally to Christ, write to all of those that they are blessed. And we're used to that word blessed. How are you doing this week? Oh, I am so blessed. Sometimes we don't stop to think exactly what that means. It's, it's another one of those words that means happy or fortunate or things are going well or uh, things are good. And so for those who have been invited, things are good. And this blessing is pronounced again and again in the book of Revelation. I'll leave it to you to pull out your word study and to do a study on blessed in the book of Revelation. 
But how precious to you, dear Christian, to know that being called by God to join him is a blessing. God didn't call you because you're holy. He called you out of sin to be washed and made holy. He didn't call you because you were obedient. He called you out of disobedience to repentance that becomes, dis- that becomes obedience. He didn't call you because you were worthy. He washed your unworthiness away and made you a beloved gift worthy for himself. Blessed are you who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, he says, the gathering together of the full church of God throughout all of the ages, united at last. This supper is the picture of a joyful celebration that follows. We look forward to celebrations around meals. That joyful celebration that follows that moment when Christ descends and ultimately raptures the church to himself. The dead in Christ rise, exploding from graves around the world. I still can't get that image out of my mind. Dust regathered and remade. The resurrection of all souls in a moment. And transformation on the spot of every living Christian. We all arrive in heaven. We all get to see Jesus. And then the celebration begins. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. That invitation, that glorious, unspeakable moment of celebration is portrayed as a feast because that's something that we can understand. John sees all of this and he looks at the angel who's been describing all of these things to him and he can't help himself. He falls down and gets ready to worship the angel and the angel says, "Ah." He says, don't do it. He says, don't worship me. I'm just a fellow servant of you and the church. Worship God and nobody else because the spirit of prophecy is about Jesus. It's not about prophecy. This is one of those things that people get so wrong about the book of Revelation. We get so wrapped up in the book of Revelation, looking at all the prophecies, getting enthralled with all of its meaning, looking at all of the minutia, and I want to do all of the same. And, And yes, there's place and opportunity and time to do all of that, but if it doesn't, point us to Christ, we have missed the purpose of Revelation. So as we seek a place to end, if we look for a place to put down our, our, uh, our feet and to land, are you looking to Jesus as we study Revelation? Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The message isn't about Revelation. The message isn't about the angel that was explaining things to John. The point of Revelation isn't so that your pastor could be loved and adored, even though I don't mind those things. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. The whole Word of God from Genesis to Revelation points us to Christ. All things are from Him, and all things are for Him. Therefore, praise God and not another.